a big shout out to our sponsor, Lever, for making this webinar possible. And no, this will not be a demo. We will not go through every feature of Lever. If you know Charney, you know that's not his style at all. Um, and I, of course, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. He is the executive editor and head of content here at Recruiting Daily. Uh, he, you know him for his candor and snark on all things HR tech. And if you came here expecting anything different, uh, you should leave. I'm sorry. Uh, no, uh, in all seriousness, stick around because you're going to hear who the self-proclaimed rain man for HR tech uh, today here to talk about the ATS. And on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Charlie. Hey, hey, thank you, Benjamin. Very good, very good. Um, <laughs> so I don't know where we're going with that, but um, I do feel uh, that that is a good segue into talking about applicant tracking systems, um, actually. Uh, so which is to say I am pretty uh, excited to share kind of what I think practitioners need to know to not get fooled again by crappy technology. Um, and like systems that just suck. So I'm kind of going to go through a little bit of the lay of the land, talk to you a little bit about the uh, ATS market uh, as is right now, um, some cool features and functions that are coming up within the space, and then I'm also going to give you some questions that you can use. Um, you know, they're pretty straightforward, but definitely uh, should get the information you need to, to make a better decision and uh, ultimately better technology. So uh, if that sounds good to everyone, feel free to tweet along at hashtag rdaily. I will not be tweeting, therefore feel free to troll me. I won't see you until the end. So with that, we'll jump right into it, if I can. There we go. Pull. How many of you love your ATS? It's my uh, news on the March voice because uh, that photo, um, who actually she looks like Taleo Stockart, so we will give her credit for that. So how many of you love your ATS? Oh, the answer, by the way, is, is like zero. Spoiler alert. All right, so we'll go, <laughs> we'll go through a little bit bigger. Um, so the thing is right now, uh, pat yourselves in the back if you're an HR recruiting practitioner. Like for once, you don't work in like a backwater where, you know, we're playing deliverance, uh, you know, uh, doing banjos at, at each other uh, while talking about compensation data. Uh, actually, right now, it's a really, really hot space, and it continues to grow. We've all seen, you know, a, a huge amount of spend uh, increase uh, within the HR technology space, a bunch of new tools and everything. That's actually estimated to keep growing. So uh, from 2017 to 2022, the next five years, uh, it's expected uh, to increase uh, every 2.4, uh, excuse me, 2.4 percent every year, uh, and ultimately by 2022, the recruiting technology and applicant tracking systems market is supposed to be 9.2 billion dollars, which, put in perspective, is actually like the state GDP of Kentucky. So um, that's that's a lot of money, basically. So uh, kind of looking, you know, at, at a bigger chunk of, of the pie. Like, we always talk about wanting to get a seat at the table uh, as recruiters in HR, right? Um, so here's a really, really good, good way, good way, way to improve your business value through big data or candidate experience or whatever the cool kids are talking about these days. Um, right now, we are pouring 3.4% of all of our corporate revenues into recruiting and retention related activities. Let me stress that of all the money, all the companies and all the world make every single year, 3.4% of that money is spent on recruiting. Good Lord, that's a lot of money. That's actually $85 billion. Can, can you hear me okay? Um, and, and that $85 billion, in fact, uh, just to put that in perspective, that's enough to buy everyone in the state of Washington a Learjet. Um, so the, they can get even higher. Uh, I can also get everyone in the country of Brazil a cup of coffee. Uh, long story short, that's more money than you make. It's also a really good opportunity to help drive improved efficiencies through applicant tracking systems. So right now, again, we're kind of looked at the overall market. Um, I don't know what this awful, awful graphic is other than I'm assuming it's an Oracle product. Uh, but uh, as you can see, basically, 
uh, they just kind of segmented out the various uh, avenues where people are spending money in the space. Uh, obviously, low growth is the boring Betty back office stuff, time and attendance, benefit management, payroll, and other fine ADP product offerings. Uh, high growth is definitely kind of the sweet spot, you know, the applicant tracking system sitting in, um, which is really, uh, you know, an amalgamation of recruiting capabilities, um, intelligent, uh, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and also um, workforce management. So definitely recruiting. Number one area of spend, congratulations, the cash is flowing in, kind of. So we'll look at the next slide. So right now, just, uh, you know, this, this chart just came out. It's objective. It's from CEB, um, who actually, while well, they just bought Wanted Analytics, uh, are a, a fairly neutral vendor. So, so this is what the market breaks down to right now. And it's actually really interesting. So, so right now, I guess Taleo uh, represents 36.4% of the market share, uh, which is a significant market leader. That said, I think this statistic also explains why uh, our, our poll showed nobody likes their ATS, right? Um, because all the good systems, as you see, uh, kind of down in the in the two percent range or lower, are actually where the innovation and, and largely the installs and growth are starting to happen. Um, but really, you're seeing a very mature market finally start to bifurcate uh, and break up and and produce actual innovation that's pushing uh, a lot of the larger players into defense mode and it's actually really cool to see because as much as we like to you know say IBM's one of the the most innovative companies in the world or you know Oracle is uh, has more cash uh, I read than like 90 percent of the US government um, and, and the best legal team in the world too so I love you guys if, if any of you are listening um, but no, all that said, really they're being forced to redefine uh, their entire way of doing business into this new model um, where we're seeing these systems really move, uh, and you'll see market share kind of aligned with this, um, from systems of record to systems of engagement. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a sec. So that's what the market looks like right now, and uh, that's a lot of change. Now. Of course, you can't be all things to all people, and, and while every applicant tracking system would like to say that they are a fully integrated, end-to-end -end talent management suite delivered seamlessly in the cloud, um, you've, you've heard this messaging before. Um, obviously, you have to augment a, a lot of their existing capabilities. There are only so many things that, that a system can do, and, and that's why you have, uh, in addition to your core system of record uh, and optimal engagement, uh, this whole ecosystem of startup vendors that are being funded uh, largely by this huge infusion of venture capital uh, into the space of people who are trying to actually solve uh, that dilemma that is in every PowerPoint presentation that recruiting is broken. Uh, and guess what? There's a 20-something entrepreneur with a website and a cool brand name ready to fix it. Uh, probably beanbags in the office too, which is really nice. But this should just give you just a sense of just how complex and confusing this market is. Totally get it. And that brings us to, you know, a pretty important question. Well, okay, what, what the hell is it do you need? So, you know, I'm, PowerPoint actually is the, the technology thing that gets me. I, I miss Clippy. Damn, Paperclip could tell you anything. But um, when we look at actually a, a history of HR tech financing and, and the deals and the dollars, uh, you can just see an acceleration as, as the market's improved. And right now we're actually entering seven years of solid job creation, uh, which is the most since uh, the 90s. And so really uh, along with, with the return in hiring, uh, the lowering unemployment rate and also the increase in workforce participation we're seeing across the board. This is really a hot space and it's a really cool opportunity to for once be ahead of the curve uh, instead of behind it because there's some really innovative stuff happening in our industry uh, and it's really exciting. Oh, next slide. So uh, this is a really confusing, like MBA style chart. And I know that most of us went to the School of Hard Knocks of foreign recruiting, uh, but all this is to say, um, this is just a look at different rounds of financing. And so what you're essentially seeing right now is fewer companies IPOing and fewer companies um, coming in uh, with just, you know, seed money uh, or, or lower stages of funding. Uh, basically when you're uh, a venture capital backed firm, you go through stages A, B, C, D, 
and then ultimately IPO or implode, um, depending on uh, what ends up happening, LinkedIn. So uh, at that point in time, um, what, you know, what we're really seeing is a consolidation of, of all the market dollars that are coming in into systems that are, are, are sort of in the middle of their development and certainly our, uh, our kind hosts fit into this model of, of uh, startups that are still starting up but are actually really mature, really sophisticated companies and that's really where the money's going. So, so these, uh, these new models of solutions are actually uh, by far the best financed uh, and the best positioned to still be around when your contract is over. And uh, next slide. So yeah, um, you know, I, Mitch Sullivan wrote a gro uh, great blog post on Recruiting Daily product tie-in um, the other day uh, where, you know, essentially he said that obviously all of the case studies you're reading about are these cool companies and they have all this money to spend on all of these technologies and point solutions, right? And you always see the same, like, Fortune 500 companies that just must have these massive budgets, you know? Like, you see the same names every time. Like, PepsiCo literally must buy every single recruiting product ever released. Um, same goes with Sodexo, right? Uh, but you're probably not one of those companies. Uh, and it really comes down largely to price point and ROI. Uh, as Mark Twain said, and I like this quote, uh, the lack of money is the root of all evil. Uh, so too it goes uh, in compensation negotiation and offer management. Next slide. So I think that largely in the space, because we think of ourselves as so data-driven, uh, one of the easiest things to obviously to do uh, when we're so uh, competent with our quantitative inputs is to buy strictly on price points. Um, the thing is that there are a whole lot of systems out there. Um, think that, the, uh, according to my colleague William Tinkup, uh, there are 41,000 um, HR technology companies out there. And all of them are fighting for a share of your wallet. And, and uh, in order to kind of get that market share in an extremely competitive market, um, a lot of them have developed price points that are just insane uh, if you take a step back and, and look at it. So one thing I say is if you are buying on price point, you get what you pay for. So um, if that's a consideration, um, probably don't need to listen to the rest of this because you can go build that on MS Access. Um, or Lotus Notes, my very first ever ATS, which I'm sure is free now. So the thing is, as much money as we've been spending, obviously, on ATS, we, we've seen the market and year-to-year -year growths. Uh, recruiters still say they don't have the right technology, which is weird given the fact that we're adding it on at this huge rate. We're adding CRM capabilities. We're adding candidate lead nurturing, segmentation, talent communities, mobile, social, cloud enablement, uh, manager self-service. You name the buzzword and I'll take the bingo. But the problem is, even with all this stuff, we still don't like it. We still think it sucks. So really, what are we spending our money on except another system that people aren't using? So I, I just went over like the vagaries of venture capital flow into the HR technology uh, industry. Uh, I talked about deal size. I talked about market ecosystem and point solutions. And right now, you're probably pulling a tally and you have like no idea what's going on right now, which is cool. I just wanted to show you that, uh, you know, obviously right now is a really interesting time to be a recruiter because the technology you're selecting obviously impacts 3.4% of corporate revenues. And uh, economically, winter is coming, and that's why this is uh, probably the, one of the more important decisions you'll ever make uh, as you move from on-premise and legacy systems into the Fables cloud. So, next slide. So, if you're like me, I, I've talked to, I actually counted briefly before this, I talked uh, in 2016 to 48 different applicant tracking system vendors, uh, which actually when I started this gig, I didn't think there were 48 applicant tracking system vendors. Um, essentially, they're all sort of selling uh, off of the same feature set. Uh, we're gonna help you hire better, faster. Um, we're gonna create cost savings by reducing agency reliance, and we're gonna build uh, a great candidate experience and dynamic, employer brand or whatever that value prop is but but really they're not all that different in fact my first true applicant tracking system which was actually bought by bullhorn was something called tempest fugit 
And man, that system sucked. It did not make time fly. Uh, it was lying to me in Latin. Um, but, you know, to be 100% honest, uh, the capability to simply manage applications and disposition those through workflow, uh, we really haven't gotten any, be any better at that. What we have seen, though, is that those systems, one of the reasons they're so obsolete and archaic, is that they were built on like a .NET framework um, sometime, you know, even as early as the early 90s um, when, as Elaine uh, Orler uh, schooled me in the history of uh, applicant tracking systems uh, at the Lever Panel in San Francisco, 1993, first applicant tracking system came out. Um, now think about where technology was then uh, and where it is now. Back then, like Microsoft was the coolest thing out there and, um, you know, we were using floppy disks. So obviously no system can really anticipate for the level of technological change and innovation that's gonna be happening even over something as short as like a three year standard contract. So the most important thing is to look at partners and integrations that they have. Do they have an open API? So are they like an Android style system? Or are they like Apple? Are they closed where every, they process everything? You definitely want to err on the side of flexibility and scalability because as your business grows, as your needs change, and as technology improves, you're going to naturally develop capability gaps your ATS can't handle. It's the systems that allow uh, interfacing with other systems that, that are more nimble and, and can handle those specific use cases and solutions. Those are really uh, what you want to drill in on. Um, so definitely don't miss the partnership and integrations conversation and always ask, do you have an open API? If the answer is no, uh, say thanks, but no thanks, and uh, maybe even a bye Felicia, but uh, it's not a great solution. So um, number two is, is pretty simple. We talked about system of engagement versus system of record. Um, applicant tracking systems largely are painful uh, to use for end users. They are in no way intuitive, and they actually add a ton of time, stress, and frustration to the process, whereas what systems should do ideally is to make the process easier, more efficient, and ultimately allow you to stop focusing on the BS, like uh, offer letter management and uh, onboarding paperwork, really focus on the strategic high value added activities, which is to say direct sourcing, building relationships with candidates, and um, you know, really spending some time building relationships instead of just sourcing pipeline, right? So, so really you wanna look for systems uh, that are built to have uh, the functionality to reach uh, externally, and uh, engage candidates as well as just track applicants internally. Um, again, number three, uh, if you look at an applicant tracking system today, we're building some really cool looking uh, career sites, you know, where we have day in the life videos and like these flash animations with our cool conference rooms and our crazy culture. Um, but at the same time, uh, from there, we unfortunately are still making our candidates click over to these awful applicant tracking system backends that like look like we took a DeLorean at 88 miles an hour down uh, Oracle's roadmap. Um, so essentially what it is that you're looking for is a, a system that's going to be able to keep pace with the expectations of your candidates and your recruiters all of whom are actually used to consumer technology. So I'll give you an example, uh, and this is a candidate experience example. Um, let's say that you were shopping uh, for a hat, as I have been known to do once in a while online. Um, essentially, um, you are not going to give that third party vendor you've never heard of your address, your former bosses, your compensation history, and in 7% of the cases still, uh, your social security number. It's just not gonna happen. You want one click and you want security. And so what you need to look at is systems that consistently deliver, not just to candidates uh, as an applicant tracking system, but as online consumers who live their lives in an environment that's all about filling out forms and, uh, and, and making purchasing decisions. So it's just another, again, online purchasing activity but the tech has to keep up or else uh, you're going back to the stone age and creating some problems. Again, uh, data driven is a really important thing to look for. Every applicant tracking system is gonna try to sell you on big data. The question you have to ask is, is that predictive or prescriptive? 
which is to say it's easy to look at historical information and use that to extrapolate future results. That's predictive analytics. That's old hat. Prescriptive is the next generation, and those are products that not only tell us what to do, but how to do it better. Um, and, and really, uh, you know, marketing has adopted this through things like A-B testing, um, you know, uh, CPA, and a lot of other tactics. But I think we'll really start seeing that move into recruiting. And you want a product that's not just going to tell you what you've done, but you want a product that tells you how you need to do it better in the future. Because you know what? Uh, ultimately, it's going to be a lot more effective and a lot more uh, cheap than hiring uh, another overpriced consultant or buying another stupid big data point solution. Um, last, and, and almost certainly not least, there are a lot of products out there. Um, certainly very few are first to market. Um, really, I think the test of a startup or any applicant tracking system period is the people behind the product. And that's just one thing you can't fake. You, you can always fake a demo environment. You can always fake capabilities. You can always you know, fake financials or stability. The one thing that you really just can't fake as a vendor is passion for the product, a clear vision for the future, and uh, an alignment with the things that will actually make your job easier and better as a recruiter. So if the people suck, know that even if it's the greatest product in the world, you're still going to have to work with those people over the course of your contract. And just because of the business we're in, uh, unfortunately, people don't put enough of premium in the fact that done right, uh, a vendor isn't a software provider, they're, they're actually a partner in the process. Okay, so five critical uh, questions of software selection. These are really easy. These will save you a lot of time. These will save you a lot of money. Uh, if you take one thing away from uh, my presentation here, it's if you are selecting any sort of point solution, applicant tracking system, um, e even a CRM technology, always ask these questions. Um, if you don't get a direct answer, uh, there's no reason. They're probably lying uh, or, or, or drill down. This is a really good framework, right? So you'll be surprised at how many vendors have trouble answering these questions. But you know the good ones come up because they're able to uh, give you a very short, succinct, and, and, and to the point uh, answer. Number one, what does your product actually do? Um, I actually just emceed a startup competition in Chicago, and, and this, this guy has spent seven minutes talking about how their product was going to change the future of work. Uh, at the end, it's like crickets, and, and I had to ask, okay, that's awesome, you're going to change work. Uh, how? Like, like, what does your product actually do? Is it creating a problem or is it solving it, right? Like the rise of video interviewing as an independent category shows that we like solutions that actually might create a layer of complexity where one doesn't exist, right? So uh, what does your product do? Essential question. How will you make my life easier? Look, at the end of the day, if it's not creating efficiencies in process, if it's not creating uh, the ability for you to be more efficient and effective at your job, to be more productive as a recruiter, to handle more recs, to talk to more candidates, to have better relationships with hiring managers, then you don't actually need the technology. You're going to spend more time implementing it and, and, and learning how to use it than you are on what you really need to do, which is to have those in-person conversations and really become a partner in the business. So if it doesn't make your life easier, then don't waste the time. Um, invest it instead in becoming a better business partner. That simple. This is like the wild card question, I don't know why. How do you make money? The answer's off of you in the margins, right? So uh, you have a few different you know, uh, ways that companies make money. You have you know, companies that will do monthly uh, recurring trials, ones that will do annual slots. You have ones even in, in the freemium category um, so Zoho is an example of Smart Recruiter's former model where it's free until you put enough data in there where it starts getting really expensive. Like, is anyone, anyone like with Major on? Major on. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Kind of. Kind of. So I'm getting a weird echo. All right. All right. So what does your product do? do. Nothing good, Citrix. So, so um, I'm going to order. I'm going to order. Hold on. Is that any better? Is that any better? Yeah, I hope so.
hope so. No. no. What, what we may do. No, so, so, I'm still getting the way. But, uh, hope you have a flower on your So, um, and how do you get it? Because you want a fixed cost that's going to be predictable. Rather than a variable cost, you have to constantly monitor or justify. Um, so, uh, how you make money is essential to know because uh, it could be some sort of weird scheme that doesn't actually add value back into the product. And uh, share if that's the uh, reason. Who owns my team? Oh, yeah. Anyone, uh, does Ooh, that have that? You miss seven hundred seventy million million. Uh, put up for sale. Um, data ownership is a good thing because for so many companies, that's their pipeline. So, sure that you can always export your data that you have and they have no means that they can use it in aggregate or that they can resell it to third party, both of which are actually scenarios that happen. Make sure that your data, which is the only thing that is your competitive in today's recruiting market, is yours because it's the most valuable intellectual property you have. Period. Uh, uh, finally, the last and, and most important question, who else can I talk to? The sales guys are good at, 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 at closing. Uh, they have an RFP with every box checked. You ask, is it on the roadmap? They say, yeah, absolutely. Even if it's not, don't trust the vendor and their reporting to make a decision. Ask to speak to existing customers and clients about their experience. The vendors who are worth actually going through this process with over the long term are going to have a long of referenceable customers uh, who are your colleagues who they will easily provide who can actually add some practitioner uh, substance to what's often a SaaS sales style. So, five questions, one takeaway. Be smart uh, about what you ask. Final slide. Could have made some more visual stuff here, but that's okay. It's good material, I promise. Make you smarter. Thank so you. sorry, Matt. And everyone on the line, if you're having any audio issues, uh, we're just having a a quick wireless issue, and it should be cleared up now. Gorgeous. Well, if you were having those audio issues, it was because your ATS is actually blocking um, this application from properly functioning. So that's uh, why this is uh, so good you tuned in. So with that, I'm going to end with five words to the wise from somebody who's actually pretty stupid. But um, pretty simply, never buy from a PowerPoint deck. Uh, if you can't see a live demo, um, if, if you can't you know, even optimally have a free trial. Uh, if you can't get your hands dirty, roll up your sleeves and see what the product's really about, because um, you're going to be living in there every day, uh, then, then you're missing out uh, on the opportunity to really make an informed decision, and you're doing it based off of what you're being told by the company rather than what you, as a recruiter, are experiencing yourselves. Um, touched on this earlier, it's on the roadmap is almost always a lie. The best products build for all of their user base rather than put development resources and programming resources against checking a box on a single like enterprise client's RFP. So if you're being promised the sun and the moon, um, you keep asking for features and they keep saying, yeah, we're working on it, it's coming out next quarter, what that means is they don't have it yet and never count on the fact that after you sign the contract, that will ever again be a priority for that vendor. So ignore that. Uh, again, ask for a free uh, try or live demo if possible. Uh, the best software speaks for itself. Um, you know, you, you see it, you know what it does. You instantly recognize whether or not it's going to help or hurt. Um, you can't do that by reading marketing collateral. Um, as much as I would like to tell my customers otherwise, um, really, uh, the proof with any true SaaS product is in the pudding. And the nice thing is you can get to that pudding from anywhere. And that was more putting references than uh, I think uh, uh, um, So again, fixed costs versus variable costs. You have a budget. It's stagnant. You don't want any surprises. 
always ask what all of the fees you'll be charged are. Is there going to be a service fee? Um, if the system goes down, are, are you going to have to have a premium for customer service to take care of that outage? Just make sure that you're able to understand that when you're buying, say, an applicant tracking system, uh, there's a lot more uh, involved in that than just buying an applicant tracking system, which is why, you know, OneSource Virtual, which all they do is implement Workday, uh, specifically the recruiting module, uh, is valued at $870 million. Um, because the you know the sticker price uh, is not necessarily the street price um, when it comes to SaaS. Um, and finally, again, your data is your competitive advantage. Um, make sure you protect that because if you do, you're going to have a leg up on your competition. Period. And you can always add tools to get more future insights out of data that's already sitting there untouched. And as we develop those capabilities, uh, there's no such thing as, as, as bad data, uh, just often irrelevant data. But, but obviously, we're working on that and make sure that it's yours and you own it and it ain't ever going to go away. All right. And now I'll turn it over to hear about a very specific applicant tracking system and one that I will say, even though they aren't sponsoring, um, it kicks a lot of butt. So there, there's my uh, actually kind of unpaid endorsement. But uh, with that, I will I will turn it over. Perfect. Thank you so much, Matt and Katrina and uh, Recruiting Daily for having us on today. Um, you know, I feel I feel smarter already, Matt. Hey, look at that. I could sell you an ATS probably. <laughs> So my name is Kieran. I'm the marketing manager at Lever and uh, figured instead of putting what makes Lever different in my own words, there's a nice little blurb from Matt here in an article that he wrote last year. Um, and I just thought it was fun. He said, Lever just feels like the future where everyone else is just building a better toaster. And this was after demoing Lever in my, I didn't actually realize that you have demoed 48 ATS vendors. So um, I, yeah, I hate yours was the prettiest though, and and ultimately <laughs> as a Chrome user, I just want something that's gonna like look and feel and operate the easiest. And I have to say that uh, from from a design standpoint, um, again, unsolicited endorsement by far and away the best product on the market. It doesn't feel like you're working with the mainframe, which uh, you know stands out when you're doing 48 demos. And you say, as a Chrome user, I think we, we like to think of, you know, Google is the cross-team project management tool, you know, Slack is the, the communication tool, and Lever is really that collaborative hiring tool. And um, what makes Lever different is, I think, that fundamental insight that recruiting just cannot exist in a silo, and recruiting software shouldn't treat it like it is. But uh, the reality is today that so many ATSs are still, you know, built for recruiters. They're not thinking about the hiring managers or the interviewers. They're just thinking about the recruiter. And that's great. The ATS obviously should think about the recruiter, but it should be empowering other team members to get involved as well. So Lever, um, very fundamentally from the beginning, was built around that insight that we need to figure out how to get every other stakeholder in the company involved. So we have features like a two-way email sync and app mentioning notes that facilitate really fast communication between the recruiter and the hiring manager and anyone else who needs to leave feedback. Um, automatic feedback reminders, really easy sourcing and referring tools to, again, get everyone helping, not just the recruiters. Um, and I think you, you open by saying that people just do not love their applicant tracking systems, which I think historically has been true. but. Um, you know, we get customers saying things to us like engineering, hiring managers hate applicant tracking systems, but they actually love Lever and they're actually logging into the tool. And, and uh, that's true, by the way. I've seen those reviews and I didn't believe it myself, but when you have a software engineer actually notice how easy it is to apply for a job and then take the time to write the company about it, like, I, I can't actually think of a stronger endorsement despite the fact that I would never have a million years believed that would have ever happened, but I've seen it with my own eyes. So if you're still dubious, then we're happy to give you all a demo. We do live demos. We won't sell you from a PowerPoint deck. Um, 
And this is just an example of, you know, what candidates are saying. We, we've built the system to be, you know, easy and collaborative on the back end for um, companies using Lever as well as, you know, seamless on the front end for the candidates who are applying. And as soon as they hit apply, it's, it's a seamless process for them all the way through. So these are just a few of our customers using Lever. And uh, Matt, could you go back to the last slide if, or the previous slide? If you guys want to want to read Matt's article, um, the bit the Bitly link is charney lever, or you can just Google that article. And um, with that, I I will hand it back to you guys. Awesome! Thank you for that plug. Definitely check out that article. I like traffic. And <laughs> um, yeah, no, um, definitely would encourage everyone to do a demo. Um, even if you know you're not necessarily on the market for a system, I do think it's a really good chance. Uh, if you're on one of the, the older legacy systems to just kind of see what's new and what's out there. Um, so you can maybe start making that next decision now and putting together that SOW well before you actually need it, uh, which is called planning. Always a good thing. So uh, I guess that's their call to action, but for once I agree with it. So. <laughs> if it ain't sure. And I, think, I think too, this is the moderator, Katrina, just chiming in. You know, do demos regularly, not just a lever, you know, find other products to actually just give it a test drive, even if you're not in the market. Um, Matt mentioned our colleague, William Tinkup, earlier. You know, he, he says, do a demo a week because it keeps you on track with trends. You know, you're not just kind of living in your own bubble as far as technology. You should see what's happening because that will give you great insight into the next round of articles you're going to read about what we should measure and what we should do and fill in the blank about all the best practice stuff that you have to read over and over again. If you're looking at technology, it's actually a great insight into what those best practices are going to be. Yeah, and just adding on that, the one thing I forgot to mention is you are always being sold on the employer instance, but as technology uh, in recruiting becomes much more consumerized, make sure that you also, before you ever, ever move forward with a product, see what it's like for the candidates too, because there's a good chance that, you know, under the hood it looks really nice, but uh, in fact it's a pinto on the outside. So um, always make sure that you look at it for both angles and candidate experience is uh, applicant drop off and all that other stuff will more or less solve itself if you're smart about it. Absolutely. All right, so we have a little bit of time for questions. Our first question is, uh, Matt, can you please give us your opinion on, it says bespoke system. I'm going to guess you know what that is. Yeah, bespoke, which is, which is a good English word um, there. It's like chuffed. Um, yeah, so bespoke systems, actually, they can be really good if you've got really good programmers um, and you're able to develop them. So I'd say Apple's, uh, despite the shadiness of having to only apply it through jobs through your Apple ID, uh, them and Google like, have great systems. Um, it, as far as the ones that I would say that I've experienced, they're generally kind of stripped down and, and much more structured uh, versions of another enterprise instance. So for instance, the one, the, the homegrown system that we worked at at Amgen um, really was, was just Connexa with some, uh, some industry functionality bolted on. So I, I, you know, I think that uh, they're not a terrible thing, but again, if you buy a, a system or look at systems that are much more flexible and scalable and give you the options to continually add features and, and optimize processes, um, then you're getting all of the benefits of a homegrown system with all of the support of you know partnering with a third-party vendor because that thing goes down at, at your company um, you better be resource correct or you're, you're going to drop candidates trying to get your servers back on uh, as recently happened to a major staffing firm. all right so Johnny wants to put you on the spot he said head Johnny to head, who comes out That's on fine. top greenhouse or lever and why um, I could give you the finance answer of that, which is going to be different than my recruiter answer, which is what I'm going to stick with, okay? So, um, really, I don't think that there's a correct answer to either other than personal preference. So what Greenhouse does is it really it, it, it is built around process and structured hiring. Right, so quantifying everything, it's almost like the Taylorism of systems. It's, it's scientific management, more or less automated with great reporting functionality. And, and if you're one of those people who really values process uh, standardization and optimization, 
uh, I think greenhouse is your option. Um, there's a huge part of the market. Again, I, I probably would, would uh, fall on this side of preference, although there is no right answer, um, who are, are going to like a system that's, that's a little bit more intuitive, uh, that's a little bit more flexible, and, and has a little bit more user-friendly configuration. Uh, one that's also got, uh, I would say, a little bit cleaner UI, UX, although obviously that could change. Um, I think it's interesting you mentioned Google a couple times, but, but the CEO of Lever, uh, actually prior to joining this crazy industry, um, actually uh, was the product manager for Chrome and basically you know, developed a product that, that cut into the huge market share of Internet Explorer. And so given that precedent and kind of where we're at as, as a market right now, um, I, I'd say historically, uh, that's not a bad track record to be going with. All right. Um, we just got a question from Randy that says, you know, I want to know how Lever can be incorporated in a traditional retained recruitment biz business model versus an internal recruitment ATS at a company. I can't answer that question other than to say, again, a good flexible system will be able to handle any sort of recruitment use case because they should be configurable enough to deal with any of those three scenarios. Um, if not, then you're probably getting ripped off. All right. Uh, Laura just asked, can you give some specific examples of what older systems like Taleo don't offer that newer systems like Lever do? Yeah, um, I would say a, a lot of that lies on, um, you know, kind of deeper analytic capabilities. And I know we, we get bored talking about big data, uh, but for example, newer systems can obviously track um, candidates from across various sources. So uh, rather than having them self-select that they came in through Indeed, whereas in fact that was a, a position that was scraped off of, let's say, Career Builder. Therefore, you know, obviously that uh, makes your spend mix change a little bit in the future, even though it's inaccurate. What these systems are able to do is really track uh, both source of hire as well as is, is create much more candidate rather than than rec centric view down the process. So we all have those positions where we're not trying to necessarily hire like a quarterback. We're looking for an athlete who can play all positions, uh, like their culture fit and they're an all star. And I think that the newer systems generally tend to take a candidate rather than requisite uh, position centric view, so that it really rewards uh, silver medalists and, and people who fit pretty closely, even if they're not right for that particular position right now. Uh, it, it's obvious they're still right for the company. And I think that really also helps to scale relationships better. Whereas, you know, you look at uh, an, an Oracle uh, ADP uh, success factors, um, candidate records are stagnant. And really what you see is a piece of paper, generally parsed from PDF, um, that's standardized. And you really know nothing more about a candidate other than notes that are uh, almost impossible to input into their records and uh, what positions they've applied for in the past. Uh, of course, you can't hardly ever find them in the future if you go to search for them. So I'd say search capability is, is, is the killer app in this as well. Um, Everyone who's ever applied to your company now is findable, and with dynamic profiling, uh, the records are actually up to date. All right. Um, so Neil just asked, you mentioned the API. Why is that so important? Um, an API is important because you never because you want your system to be able to talk to other systems, right? As as the industry consolidates, you have more vendors trying to own a, a higher percentage of talent management transactions, as they like to say, I think, from, from hire to retire. Um, essentially, you know, what you're doing in, in that particular case is you are entrusting all of your information to one vendor. You are reliant on their single product team to keep pace with market innovation. And if you find, a, you know, one of those really cool products that you just need, um, chances are you're going to have to do a pretty costly um, custom uh, implementation configuration uh, with that. So having an API is really important because you never know what the next cool thing is going to be. And because your system is not going to be able to uh, flex fast enough in order to meet those needs, um, you want it to at least be able to interface with the point solutions that can. All right. Uh, so last question that we have time for, why do you think there 
such a high rate of recruiters don't have the right technology in the first place? Yeah, that's a good question, and I actually don't blame the technology. So again, um, applicant tracking systems really have not changed that much in the last decade. Um, obviously, we've added some features and functionalities, and, and there are some that we've mentioned that, that are disruptive forces. But, but honestly, I think, um, and there's an interesting article uh, by, by a woman named Bahar on Recruiting Daily about this today, it, it's that we actually don't take the time to learn the systems properly, right? So like Brass Ring 8, which I was using it in 2008, um, actually had a, uh, a capability where it could match any candidate in the database by cutting and pasting a job description. I think I was the only person, you know, out of the hundreds of recruiters at my company who actually knew that functionality existed. Um, I was the only dork who was reading those three ring binders, you know, and taking like super user training classes. But, but, it, but at the end of the day, systems probably will always surprise you, even if they're the older ones, with what they can do. The problem is recruiters don't ever take the time to, to figure it out and instead then just decide to not use the system at all, And which is why we only use an ATS when that applicant is already an identified candidate. Everything else is pretty much done on you know Pat's paper, and that's bad for everyone. 